Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 197, Noah Worcester on Atonement, Part 2. Chapter 14, The Different Senses in Which One Person Is Said to Die or Suffer for Another. The scriptures exhibit various senses in which one person may die or suffer for another, as will appear from the following passages and remarks. Because I said, lest I die for her, Genesis 26, 9, this was Isaac's answer to Abimelech, who questioned him why he called his wife his sister. The meaning obviously is that he did so through fear that someone would kill him to obtain Rebecca if he called her his wife. Abraham had adopted the same policy as he said, lest they slay me for my wife's sake, that is, for the sake of obtaining her. Would God I had died for thee, O Absalom, my son, my son, 2 Samuel 18.33. Thus David expressed his regret that he had not died instead of his wicked son. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. John 11.50 These are the words of Caiaphas respecting our Savior. In the next verse he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. It is not supposed that Caiaphas had any idea that Christ would die for that nation in either of the senses supposed by different sects of Christians. He probably encouraged the putting of Christ to death, thinking or pretending to think that if he were allowed to go on making disciples, an insurrection would occur and bring on the Jews the vengeance of the Roman government. In 2 Chronicles 25, 3 and 4, we are told that when Amaziah became king, he slew his servants who had killed his father, but he slew not their children, but did as it is written in the law of Moses, The fathers shall not die for the children, neither shall the children die for the fathers, but every man shall die for his own sin. The law referred to is Deuteronomy 24.16. The same principle is repeated in Ezekiel 18.20. It is obvious that in these passages the meaning is that one person shall not be killed or punished for the sin of another. For one to die for another in this sense is a very different thing from what was intended in any of the preceding cases. Let it then be remembered that it was an established principle in the divine law that one should not be punished for the sin of another. Greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friend. John 15.30. This was the language of Christ to his disciples. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love for us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. On this passage I may remark, first, there is such a thing as one's dying for a good man, that is, probably to save the life of a good man or good person. In this sense, we may suppose that Peter said to our Lord, I will lay down my life for thy sake. Though he failed in the hour of trial, yet in what he said he doubtless meant to express the strength of his affection for Christ. In the same sense, Paul says of Priscilla and Aquila, who for my life laid down their own necks, Romans 16.4. Second, in the passage under consideration, it is not intimated that the sufferings of Christ were any greater or of a different nature than if he had suffered the death of the cross for good men. Nothing is mentioned as evincing the greatness of divine love in that event, but the unworthiness of the objects for whom Christ died, and his own worthiness or dignity. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Third, we should observe that it was the greatness of God's love towards sinners, not the greatness of his anger, that was commended to us in the death of his Son.
A similar view of the sufferings of Christ is given by him in Matthew 20, 27, and 28. Whosoever will be the chief among you, let him be your minister, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life as a ransom for many. To be a minister here is meant a servant, and Christ would have his apostles display the same mind that was in himself, and be ready to do or to suffer anything by which the good of others might be promoted. In John chapter 10, Jesus exhibited a contrast between the hireling and the true shepherd. The hireling was one who would flee when he saw the wolf coming, but the good shepherd would expose or lay down his life for the sheep. In verse 15, he says plainly, I lay down my life for the sheep. As Christ laid down his life for us, John infers, we ought also to lay down our lives for the brethren. On this principle, the apostles and early Christians exposed themselves to persecution, suffering, and death to promote the cause for which Christ came into the world and sacrificed his life. He suffered as the captain of our salvation and was made perfect through suffering. Several important purposes were answered by his death, which were not to be effected by the sufferings of his apostles. Still, the ultimate purpose was the same in both cases, the salvation of sinners. There are several distinct senses in which one person may be said to suffer or die for another. The question naturally occurs, in which of these senses did Christ suffer and die for sinners? The prevalent opinion has been that he suffered and died as a substitute for sinners. But to this hypothesis there are many objections, some of which may be briefly stated. Objection 1. The death which Christ endured for us was natural or temporal death. Yet all men, the friends as well as the enemies of Christ, are still liable to natural death. How then could Christ's death be a substitute for ours? Objection 2. If it be said that he suffered the wrath of God as our substitute, why are we still liable to penal sufferings? Objection 3. The hypothesis that God inflicted on the innocent the penal evils do us ascribes to God a mode of conduct and a principle of government which he forbids men to adopt and which he himself has positively disclaimed. Objection 4. The principle which the hypothesis ascribes to God is always unjust and cruel when adopted by men. Objection 5. To interpret the phrases in relation to Christ suffered for us and died for us as meaning substituted suffering and death is to depart from all the analogies of the Bible in the use of such phrases in relation to other persons, excepting merely the cases which relate to forbidden conduct and a disclaimed principle. After God had forbidden the Israelites to punish the innocent for the offenses of the guilty and had assured them that this practice did not pertain to his mode of government, is it to be admitted that he adopted this very principle for the display of his justice? If we know in what sense a good shepherd is said to lay down his life for his sheep, we may know in what sense the Lord Jesus laid down his life for us. For he was the good shepherd, and we were as his sheep gone astray. In seeking our recovery, he had to encounter enemies and dangers, and to endure sufferings and death. The object of Christ's mission was the recovery of men from a state of sin and misery, to reconcile them to God that they might become obedient and happy. And in pursuing this benevolent object, he exposed himself to suffering and to death, and not only thus exposed himself, but actually suffered and died. It is with perfect propriety and according to a common usage of language said of him that he suffered for us, died for us, laid down his life for us. But that his sufferings were not the effects of God's displeasure against him as our substitute is, to my mind, very clear from the following passages of Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 but God commendeth his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8 He who spared not his own son, 
but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans 8.32 That he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Hebrews 2.9 Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4.10 I hardly know of any language which could more clearly convey the idea that both the mission and the sufferings of the Son of God were the fruits of God's love to sinful men. Even in regards to the propitiation or reconciling sacrifice, John says, herein is love, the love of God, not his wrath. It seems to me that the gospel does not exhibit God to us as such an austere sovereign that he cannot forgive even a penitent without inflicting the deserved evils on an innocent victim, but as a being who has indeed a father's heart and is disposed by tender compassion for his guilty offspring to do all that wisdom and love shall dictate to reconcile and save them. In the exercise of the purest love, he sent his son not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Though God well knew that the mission of the Son would cost him his life, and though the Son was one in whom he was ever well pleased, yet such was his love to us that he did not withhold this object of his most tender affection, but delivered him up for us all when this became necessary to the accomplishment of his benevolent purpose respecting our salvation. This delightful view of the subject appears to me greatly authorized by the gospel, And with great propriety, the intelligence of such love may be called good tidings. This view of the subject seems also to accord with God's long-suffering conduct towards Adam and his posterity subsequent to the fall, and with the goodness of the divine character as revealed to Abraham, to Moses, and to the people of Israel, both by words and symbolical institutions. I may add that this view of the subject excludes the awful the painful and, to me, unnatural idea of God's displaying avenging justice on an innocent and holy victim as necessary to the exercise of forgiving love toward his penitent children. It is presumed that this supposed example of the mode of divine forgiveness has never been and never can be imitated by any enlightened and benevolent being in the universe, yet every Christian is required to forgive as God forgives. This thought may be further illustrated in a subsequent chapter. Chapter 15 In what sense did the Messiah bear the sins of many? Isaiah 53, 6 The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. To one accustomed to regard the atonement by Jesus Christ as a display of God's anger, this text will naturally be deemed a strong proof of the correctness of that doctrine. But it should be recollected that the inspired writers were in the habit of regarding God's hand in all afflictions by whatever secondary causes or agents they might have been produced. Satan and wicked men were agents in stripping Job of his property, his servants, and his children. Yet Job piously eyed the hand of God in these events, and therefore said, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. The idea of substituted suffering is essential to the prevalent theory respecting the atonement, and also essential to the hypothesis that the anger or avenging justice of God was displayed in the sufferings of Christ. But of all the instances where the scripture talks of one bearing the iniquities of another, I think there is not one in which can be discovered the least appearance of substituted suffering. And this circumstance is, in my mind, strong proof that the nature of Christ's sufferings have been greatly misunderstood and that the prevalent hypothesis respecting them is incorrect and unwarranted by the Bible. It is said of Christ, He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. 
It could only be in a metaphorical sense that he bore our griefs, our sicknesses, or our sins. Matthew, after recording the many miracles which Jesus performed on a certain occasion, tells us that these things were done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, that he took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. If then Christ might bear our sicknesses by exercising a benevolent sympathy and his power of healing, why not bear our sins by benevolent labors and sufferings to redeem us from all iniquity? I see no more evidence that in bearing our sins he bore our punishment than that in bearing our sicknesses he suffered all the pains and distresses of which he relieved others. Not only did Christ bear our infirmities, but Christians are required to bear the infirmities and burdens of each other. We then who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, Romans 15.1, bury one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6 2. It surely is not by having the infirmities and burdens of others transferred to me that I am to comply with these exhortations. I am not to become their substitute, but I am to exercise toward them a Christ like sympathy and do what I can for their relief and comfort. For consider him that endured or bore such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Hebrews 12.3 How did Christ bear or endure the contradiction of sinners against himself? In other words, how did he bear the oppression, mockings, revilings, and insults of his persecutors before and at the time of his crucifixion? Was it by suffering the punishment due to his persecutors? Or did he bear all of this by the display of a meek and forgiving temper towards his enemies, and by prayers, labors, and sufferings for their benefit. If the latter was the way in which he bore the contradiction, insults, and cruelties of his persecutors, why not thus bear the sins of many? Hebrews 13.13 says, Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. How are Christians to bear the reproach of their Lord? Is it by having his reproach transferred to them, so that he may be relieved from it? Can we bear his reproach in no other way than by suffering as he did the death of a malefactor? If we may truly bear his reproach by being so affected with it as to be willing to do and to suffer whatever may be necessary to advance the cause for which he suffered, then he might bear our sins by being so affected with our condition as sinners as freely to lay down his life for our sakes. 2 Corinthians 4.10 says, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. This Paul spoke of himself and his fellow sufferers in the cause of Christ. By the dying of the Lord Jesus is unquestionably meant the sufferings of Christ as the captain of our salvation. How then did Paul and his companions always bear about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus? Was it by having the sufferings of Christ transferred to them so that they were continually enduring the death of the cross? This will hardly be said. By this form of speech, some suppose Paul expressed his constant suffering or exposedness to suffering and his willingness to suffer in the cause for which the Savior died. This may not be all that the words were meant to imply. They might mean that the apostles constantly kept in mind the event of their Lord's death the objects for which he died, and the temper he displayed under suffering, and that by a consideration of these things they were animated in their work and excited to patience, fortitude, and perseverance, notwithstanding all the trials and persecutions which they were called to endure. Of Jesus, it is said, who bare our sins in his own body on the tree. Of Paul, it is said, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Here let it be remarked that Christ bore our sins, and Paul bore Christ's sufferings or dying. If then it be the correct mode of interpretation to say that in bearing our sins, Christ bore the punishment due to us, why must we not say that in always bearing about the dying of the Lord Jesus, the sufferings of the cross were transferred from Christ to Paul? Christ suffered for our sake, and Paul suffered for Christ's sake. But in neither case do I perceive anything like substituted penal suffering.
If, however, in bearing our sins, Christ bore our punishment, why is it not just to infer that in bearing the dying of our Lord, Paul bore over again the punishment due us all? As there are many cases in which one is represented as bearing or having borne the sins of others, it is not remarkable that a meaning has been given to the words when applied to Christ, which is essentially different from their meaning in every other case in which they are used in the Bible. Chapter 18 Christ's Views of His Own Sufferings Had the Messiah understood that His sufferings were to be a substitute for the punishment due to sinners, it is reasonable to suppose that he would have given some intimation of the fact, either in announcing the objects of his mission, in predicting his own sufferings, in his private interview with his apostles before the crucifixion, or in what he said on the day of judgment. What, then, are the facts in these cases? First, in all that Christ said of the objects of his mission, I have been unable to find a word which has any appearance of intimating that he came to suffer as our substitute. It is true that in one instance he said, The Son of Man is come not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. But the meaning of this has been explained, and I hope satisfactorily, in chapter 10. Second, in various forms, the Messiah predicted his own sufferings and death, but in all of them he was silent as to his suffering as a substitute. On one occasion, he predicted his own death by saying, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John three fourteen and 15. Let it then be considered that the brazen serpent was not lifted up as an expression of God's anger, but of his saving mercy, and that even so, the Messiah was to be lifted up as an appointed means for the healing of our moral maladies. In the parable of the vineyard, the Savior foretold, in a very intelligible manner, that his death would be effected by persecutors. The prophets that had been sent to the Jews he denominated servants, while well, he took to himself the rank and title of an only son. Though the Jews had persecuted the prophets, beating some and killing some, yet having one son, God sent him, saying, They will reverence my son. But they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Mark 12, 1-9 How could Christ have more clearly represented that his sufferings would be of a nature similar to the sufferings of the prophets that had been persecuted even unto death? Besides, Jesus was so far from representing that his sufferings would be a substitute for the sufferings of his enemies that he forewarned them that God would destroy the murderers of his son. There is still further evidence that Christ foretold his sufferings, not as effects of God's avenging justice, but as the effects of persecuting malignity. A little before the account of the transfiguration, Matthew says, From that time forth Jesus began to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Matthew 16.21 From this passage it would seem that Matthew here meant to give the substance of what Jesus from that time forth communicated to his apostles respecting the sufferings that he was to endure and what would be the nature and causes of his death Mark and Luke both mention this instance of Christ foretelling his death. Besides this, Luke mentions what the angels said on the subject to the women at the sepulcher of Jesus after his resurrection. Perceiving that the object of the women was to see the body of Jesus, the angels said to them, He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Luke 24, 6 and 7. Such were the predictions of the Messiah respecting his own sufferings, without any intimation that to the many things which he should suffer from the elders and chief priests would be superadded infinitely greater sufferings from the avenging justice of God. Third, with respect to the private interview of Christ with his disciples a little before his death, it may be observed that it appears to have been his desire not only to instruct them but to comfort them and to suggest considerations adapted to fortify their minds and to prepare them for the awful event which was then at hand.
If he had understood that his sufferings were to be a substitute for the punishment due to the apostles and all other sinners, that this was the only ground on which any sinner could be forgiven, and that this doctrine was to be the theme of apostolic preaching, how natural it must have been for him in that interview to disclose the all-important facts. Surely nothing could have been more natural or more interesting, yet we look in vain to find one idea of this kind in any part of the interview. I can account for the silence on no other ground than that Jesus had no such ideas to communicate. In other words, that he did not understand that his sufferings were to be a substitute for the punishment due sinners. Fourth, if the sufferings of Christ were known to him as a substitute for the punishment due sinners and the only ground on which God pardons the penitent, it would be natural to expect to find these essential ideas clearly communicated in what he said of the day of judgment and future retribution. But in all he said on these subjects, I have not found the least allusion to such a doctrine or such a mode of divine forgiveness. On the contrary, the Messiah, in unequivocal language, represented that men will be rewarded or punished according to their own characters or works. The faithful servant is to be rewarded according to his improvement of the talents committed to his trust. The slothful servant is to be punished for hiding his talent in the earth or neglecting to improve it. To the one class of people, the king or judge will say, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. But why this mark of approbation and acceptance? Does the judge say, For I suffered an equivalent for all the miseries which justice could have inflicted on you, and ye are justified by the imputation of my righteousness. Not a word of all this is to be found as uttered by the judge. But in assigning the reasons for his approbation, he says, For I was hungry, and ye gave me food. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was stranger, and ye lodged me. I was naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye assisted me. I was in prison, and ye visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see thee hungry, and feed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When did we see thee a stranger, and lodge thee, or naked, and clothe thee? When did we see thee sick, or in prison, and visited thee? The king will reply to them, Verily I say unto you, that inasmuch as ye have done this to any the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Matthew 25, 35-40 Is it then to be believed that the Savior himself would have given such an account of the ground or reasons of our acceptance with God, had he supposed that the penitent can be justified or pardoned only on the grounds of substituted sufferings or the imputation of his righteousness? The followers of Christ are by him encouraged to expect that all their benevolent works will be remembered at the great day and rewarded by grace. Instead of teaching them that they are to be rewarded only on the ground of what he has done and suffered for them, he taught that they are to be rewarded according to what they shall have done and suffered for him. What they do for his disciples, he accounts as done to himself, and not even the giving of a cup of water to a disciple in the name of a disciple is to fail of a gracious reward. He also pronounces them blessed who suffer for righteousness' sake, and assures them that great shall be their reward in heaven. Is not this a perfect contrast to much of the preaching of the present day? Chapter 19 Apostolic Views of Christ's Sufferings If the apostles had understood the sufferings of Christ as a substitute for the future punishment of those who obey the gospel, it is reasonable to suppose that this doctrine would have been clearly stated and urged on the day of Pentecost, after they had been so wonderfully filled with the Spirit of God. The death of Christ was then a recent event. It was the great topic of conversation and inquiry, and it was distinctly brought to view in the first sermon of Peter on that occasion, and in the subsequent sermons recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. The preachers were very careful to show that Jesus was the Christ, and that his death and resurrection accorded with the ancient predictions respecting the Messiah 
and were therefore proofs that Jesus was the person whose coming had been foretold by Moses and other prophets. Had these preachers supposed also that the sufferings of Christ were a substitute for the future punishment of all who should believe on him, and that this was the only ground on which God could pardon any sinner, is it possible they should have omitted to say a single word on this doctrine in all their sermons which were put on record? The first sermon of Peter had a powerful effect. The hearers were pricked in their hearts, filled with concern, and exclaimed, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter answered, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. We have therefore strong evidence that such views of the atonement as have been prevalent were not entertained by the apostles and were not necessary to the most salutary effects in preaching the gospel. We have in the Acts sketches of a number of Paul's sermons as well as of Peter's, and it appears that Paul was as silent as Peter respecting the doctrine of substituted sufferings. I do not find that either of them or any other inspired teacher ever taught that Christ suffered the penalty due to our sins or an equivalent for that penalty. The manner in which the apostles spoke of the crucifixion is also to be noticed. If the prevalent views of the atonement are correct, the mere sufferings of the cross must have been as nothing or no more than a drop to the ocean compared with the infinity of sufferings which Christ endured as our substitute. Yet the supposed superadded sufferings occasioned by the justice and anger of God are not, I think, so much as alluded to by the apostles. In two instances they have indeed mentioned that he bore our sins or the sins of many, but I think it has been shown that this phraseology does not imply punishment or divine anger. Besides, it was in his own body, on the tree, that he is said to have borne our sins. This implies no more than sufferings by crucifixion. Paul tells us of his preaching Christ crucified and of his determination not to know anything among the Corinthians except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Had he known that Christ endured for us a species of sufferings infinitely more intense and horrible than those of the crucifixion, would he have omitted to mention them? In speaking of Christ to the Philippians, he tells us that being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. Why did he say, even the death of a cross, if this were but the shadow of the evils he endured? Why did he not say, in the bold, emphatic language of modern writers, that Christ suffered for us the wrath of God, equivalent to all the horrors and miseries of hell, as great as the endless sufferings of all mankind? If such were the facts, and such the ground and the only ground on which the penitent can be pardoned, the conduct of the apostles in uniformly omitting to state it is to me perfectly inexplicable. Christ and his apostles must have had some weighty reason to neglect to state, explain, and urge the doctrine of vicarious punishment as the only ground of pardon. And I can think of no reason which appears to me so probable as this, that they had no belief in such a doctrine. Chapter 21, The Doctrine and Duty of Forgiveness Forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin is an important trait of Jehovah's character as he revealed it to Moses when he caused his glory to pass before this favored prophet. But the duty of men in respect of forgiving one another was much less clearly taught by Moses than it was by the Messiah. In the New Testament, the forgiving love of God is made an example for our imitation and our compliance with this duty is made a condition of our obtaining forgiveness. Thus our Savior taught his disciples to pray, Our Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. At the close of the form of prayer, Christ enforced the duty of forgiveness by the most solemn considerations. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive your trespasses. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Not only are we required to pray that God would forgive us as we forgive others, but we are required to forgive as God forgives and as Christ forgives. Be ye kind to one another, 
tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you, or as God, through Christ or in Christ, hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32 If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ hath forgiven you, so also do ye. Colossians 3.13 We are required to forgive as God forgives. If then it be a truth that God never grants absolute pardons, never forgives but on the ground of vicarious suffering, is it not a clear case that we are required to forgive only on such ground? If it be the glory of God to forgive only on this principle, must not it be our glory to imitate this example? But what good man ever did or ever can imitate this supposed example of God? Savages and other wicked men have avenged wrongs on the innocent and then made peace with the guilty. But what good man could bear the thought of inflicting evil on the innocent that he might forgive as God forgives? Or who ever thought of inquiring whether he had inflicted a vicarious punishment or made a display of avenging justice prior to forgiving the offense of a brother that he might properly pray, Forgive as we forgive? What wise and benevolent parent would not shudder at the thought of teaching his children never to forgive wrongs till they had avenged them by inflicting evil on the innocent? What good parent could set before his children an example of forgiveness on this principle? Yet how many parents and even ministers can teach children that such is God's mode of forgiveness? There is surely an alarming error somewhere in regard to this momentous subject, the duty of forgiveness, and this error should be carefully sought out and corrected. I think that on due inquiry, the doctrine of substituted suffering as a principle of divine forgiveness will either be discarded or that Christians will feel bound to reduce the principle to practice in their mode of forgiving one another. Let no one imagine that this is an uninteresting subject or one that may be trifled with, for we must forgive as God forgives or fail of being forgiven. Chapter 22, On God's Forgiving for Christ's Sake In the preceding chapter, on quoting the words of Paul as given in the Common Version, Forgiving one another as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you, I gave what is supposed to be a more correct translation, As God through Christ or in Christ hath forgiven you. This, however, I did not because I perceived any incorrectness in the idea that God forgives for Christ's sake. Some, however, conceive that this form of speech seems to imply a reluctance on the part of God to forgive the penitent. To me, it suggests no such idea, but simply this, a disposition on the part of God to honor the mediator in his manner of bestowing pardon on those for whose benefit the Son had laid down his life. The same idea is, if I mistake not, expressed by John. Referring to Christ, he says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. 1 John 2.12 To forgive for Christ's sake seems to me the same as to forgive for his name's sake. Perhaps it may be asked, how can we forgive as God does if he forgives for Christ's sake? I answer, as God has respect to the honor of his Son in forgiving offenses, so should we. The honor of the Father and the Son should be regarded by us in all we do in imitation of their examples or in obedience to their commands. In Job 42, 7 and 8, we have a remarkable passage. God is represented as being displeased with Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad for things they had uttered in their interview with Job. He directed them to take seven bullocks and seven rams and go to Job and offer a burnt offering, assuring them that Job would pray for them. For him, said God, I will accept. What was directed to be done in this case was doubtless of the nature of an atonement or a reconciling sacrifice. It evinces God's disposition to forgive and to regard the prayer of a man of eminent piety. But if the sacrifice had been of the nature of a substitute for punishment, why was the prayer of Job necessary? If a substitute for punishment is at all represented in the case, The prayer of Job seems to have a higher claim to be so regarded than the burnt offering. Why may not the same be said of the prayers of Christ and the sufferings of Christ? If God has no pleasure in the death or sufferings of the wicked, he surely could have none in the sufferings of his Son. 
It must have been the submissive, meek, and forgiving temper manifested by the Son under his sufferings which rendered the sacrifice acceptable to God and not the exquisite torments which the Son endured. It requires a diabolical temper to derive pleasure from the mere sufferings endured by another. Chapter 25, Probable Causes of Error Relating to the Atonement Long before the coming of the Messiah, the Gentile nations had been in the habit of offering sacrifices to appease or to propitiate their imaginary gods, and human sacrifices were perhaps deemed the most efficacious. Such were probably the customs and the views of the heathen ancestors of all the present nations of Christendom when the gospel was first introduced among them, and as the gospel made known the fact to them that the Messiah had suffered as a sacrifice, it would be very natural for these heathen-taught ancestors to suppose that the sacrifice was made to appease the anger of the God of Israel and to render him propitious. When, therefore, they avowed themselves Christians, many of them might still retain their former views of sacrifices and associate them with that of the Lamb of God. The great sacrifice was made on a principle and for a purpose directly the reverse of those recognized in the heathen sacrifices. It was made not by the offending party to reconcile the party injured, but by the injured party to conciliate offenders. God needed not the sufferings of an innocent victim to render him propitious. The sacrifices of a broken spirit and contrite heart with their genuine fruits and expressions were the sacrifices which he required of men and with which he was ever well pleased. To produce such sacrifices was, I conceive, the purpose of the Mosaic sacrifices and of their antitype, the blood of the Lamb of God. As the sacrifice was made on the part of God, so he came with his Son and in his Son to manifest towards us his forgiving love and his ardent desire for our reconciliation. As it will not be without pain to myself that the following queries will be proposed, I hope they will be received and considered with candor. With this hope I proceed to ask, Has it not been a common thing with Christians to impute to Jehovah a character too nearly resembling that of a pagan deity whose anger could not be appeased but by sufferings and blood? Has not the gospel atonement been too commonly regarded as a sacrifice made for similar purpose to that for which the pagans offered human sacrifices? Has not the general practice of the pagans in offering sacrifices to propitiate their gods been often urged by Christian writers as a proof that there was nothing in the atonement made by the death of Christ contrary to the light of nature or the dictates of reason? Has not this too been done without adverting to the fact that the gospel sacrifice was made on a principle the reverse of that on which the pagan sacrifices were offered? There surely is not only a conceivable but a very important difference in the two cases, a difference which should not be lost sight of by Christians. For when they lose sight of this distinction as to represent that the gospel sacrifice and the heathen sacrifices were offered on the same general principle, it seems to me difficult, if not impossible, that any clear views of the love of God in not sparing his own Son should be entertained. I willingly concede that the word atonement would be applicable to this sacrifice whether the purpose were to reconcile God to us or us to God. But the two purposes are very different. The former was the purpose of heathen sacrifices, the latter the purpose of that made by the Son of God. Let us listen to the language of the Apostle. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, being reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. Romans 5.10 
all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. How different and how lamentable are the following ideas expressed by so good a man as Dr. Watts. Well, the Redeemer's gone to appear before our God to sprinkle o'er his burning throne with his atoning blood. No fiery vengeance now, no burning wrath comes down. If justice calls for sinner's blood, the Savior shows his own and quenched the Father's flaming sword in his own vital blood. The Father lays his vengeance by and smiles upon his Son. Come, let us lift our joyful eyes up to the courts above, and smile to see our Father there upon a throne of love. Once t'was a seat of dreadful wrath and shot devouring flame, our God appeared consuming fire and vengeance was his name. Rich were the drops of Jesus' blood that calmed his frowning face, that sprinkled o'er the burning throne and turned the wrath to grace. What Christian can be duly aware of the implication in these poetical effusions and not weep that such sentiments are circulated through the land and impressed on the minds of millions by all the weight of a character so deservedly esteemed as that of Dr. Watts? Do not some of these sentiments bear a shocking resemblance to those entertained by pagans in sacrificing to their vindictive deities? Is not the gospel atonement here represented as having its principal effect not on the minds of sinners who need a moral change, but on the mind of God, who is always love, and with whom there is no variableness, nor even a shadow of turning? The change in his mind by the application of atoning blood is indeed represented as having been very great so great as to quench the Father's flaming sword and turn his wrath to grace. Did Paul, on his way to Damascus, experience a greater change than this? If the representation be just, what must have been the moral character of God prior to this wonderful conversion? And if the views of Dr. Watts, as represented in these extracts, are correct, does it not follow that the Lamb of God came rather to take away his Father's anger? than the sins of the world? I can hardly forbear shuddering while I write such questions, and I should certainly erase them were it not deeply impressed on my mind that the popular views are in a high degree reproachful to God and injurious to men, and that the time has come when the subject should be more thoroughly examined that it may be better understood. In reply, it may probably be said that the clergy of New England have already generally discarded such views of the atonement as are contained in the extracts from Dr. Watts. I hope it is even so, but a great portion of the people of our country may be expected to cherish those ideas as long as they shall be retained in popular hymn books for public worship and private devotion. If the clergy have become convinced that such views are erroneous and reproachful to God, Ought they not exert their influence to have them excluded from the hymn books which have their patronage? It surely cannot be a matter of indifference what views of God we entertain, nor what views we occasion to be entertained in the minds of others. Conclusion It seems to be desirable that we should have some satisfactory ideas respecting the way in which the atoning sacrifice has its saving influence. Yet some of the most eminent advocates for vicarious punishment or substituted sufferings have freely acknowledged that they did not understand how the atonement has its influence on salvation or how it is connected with forgiveness. On the theory proposed in the preceding pages, I have endeavored to show not only that the sacrifice is connected with forgiveness, but what is the connecting link and how the connection is formed. What I have written on that point may not prove satisfactory to others, but no part of the inquiry has resulted in more satisfaction to my own mind. When a conscientious writer is about to publish such views of an important doctrine as are very different from those which have been generally entertained, he cannot be indifferent in regard to their moral tendency. He will seriously consider what influence they must naturally have should they be cordially adopted. This inquiry I have endeavored to make in regard to the views I have given of the atoning sacrifice, 
nor have I been unmindful of the fact that this may probably be my last publication, and that very possibly I may be summoned to my final account before the contents of these pages shall appear in print. On the most solemn and impartial inquiry, I can say with truth that I have both found consolation and encouragement from the belief that no danger can possibly result to any soul from a cordial and practical adoption of the views I have given of the great sacrifice. God may have had purposes to answer by that event which I have not discovered. If it be so, I think the undiscovered purposes cannot be so different from those which have been stated as to change the character of the sacrifice. As to danger, it is my firm belief that there can be no more danger in embracing the views which have been urged than in obedience to the following precepts, Love your enemies, that ye may be the children of your Father who is in heaven. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil by good. For in my view, these precepts perfectly accord with the spirit of every moral truth which was expressed in the sacrifice. The more, therefore, we imbibe this spirit, the more we shall bear the moral image both of the Father and the Son. On such views of the sacrifice we may meditate by day and by night, and from year to year, without the least danger of finding anything in them to excite or to cherish a resentful spirit or a disposition to avenge a wrong prior to forgiving it. On the contrary, the more we reflect on the forgiving love displayed on that occasion, the more likely we shall be to feel the importance of possessing the Spirit of Christ. If we possess this forgiving love, we are assured that God will forgive us. Hence, we shall have nothing to fear from his avenging justice, but much to hope from the ocean of his mercy. He who spared not his Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? And who or what can ever separate us from love like this, if in obedience to its dictates we become reconciled unto God? On this ground, I may adopt the language of Paul, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. This week's sneaking music has been the track Pierre by Hicham Chahidi. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode where you can listen to and download that entire track. And if you'd like to read this whole book by Noah Wooster called The Atoning Sacrifice, A Display of Love, Not of Wrath, you can buy a paperback copy of it. It's at lulu.com. You can search for it there or there's a direct link to it on the blog post for this episode. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.